gold? Well, we don't actually know how much the state has. Um, the point I made when we last spoke, that China actually had um, set out a deliberate policy from 1983 onwards of acquiring and accumulating physical gold. And um, I think that just as a, as a recap, uh, the reason they started letting the public in in 2002, when it then became legal for an ordinary citizen in China to acquire gold, was because the state had got enough for its purposes, whatever those purposes were. Uh, and the point um, about the quantity is that if you look at the capital inflows going into China, the trade, um, those were particularly in the 80s, uh, and the trade surpluses that generated in the 90s, and you take roughly 10% of the value of those, uh, and that would, that would give you a figure of somewhere between 20 and 25,000 tons of gold. Uh, and so at that point, um, I could see that there would be some sense in um, the Chinese state accumulating that quantity of gold. Now, at the beginning of that time, I think that they were probably acquiring it for portfolio reasons as much as anything, in the same way that the Arabs did when the oil price uh, rocketed in the in the 1970s. Um, but latterly, I think as uh, particularly the Shanghai Cooperation Organization was formed uh, with Russia really as the other dominant player um, in that organization, I think that the um, reasons for gold ownership uh, switched, if you like, to strategic. And uh, here we're talking about um, the, um, uh, the, the, the gold production, both from China and Russia, uh, together uh, being considerably greater than from any other part of the world. And uh, at the same time, we probably have a situation where America has uh, sold quite a lot of gold without declaring it. Now, we don't know this. We don't know this for certain. Um, uh, and uh, if that is the case, then obviously it does make sense for China and Russia between them to accumulate gold, to give themselves uh, a position of power over the United States. Because, you know, if you end up with, and I, I, I use the term nuclear war advisedly because it would be so destructive if they went down this route. Um, but if, if, if uh, America goaded them into... Um, uh, admitting exactly how much gold they had uh, and driving the gold price up. And particularly if America has uh, sold uh, a lot of her physical gold uh, without uh, declaring it, then you can see that uh, the balance of power would shift, the balance of economic power would shift very sharply from the West to the East. And it would really give Russia and China uh, global dominance in terms of uh, the economic future for the world. Uh, so th we're, we're talking a very, very big, deep game here, uh, and we can only speculate on the sidelines as to exactly what the position is. And I think that, um, you know, my, my uh, suggestion that they could easily, the state could easily have 20 or 25,000 tons must be looked at in that light. Um, of course, this, is, this does not include the gold that has been accumulated by private individuals in China since 2002. And uh, I think the figure there would be something like ten to fifteen thousand tons in total. Now that that figure that I've just uh, stated would is is considerably more than uh, the uh, World Gold Council admits. Um, but the World Gold Council looks at uh, gold accumulation a different way. They tend to talk to uh, the jewelers and fabricators and uh, get some sort of idea as to how much has been turned into into jewelry. Um, and um, they seem to have been in denial as to actually what the deliveries from the Shanghai Gold Exchange represent. Uh, these, that represents gold that is delivered out of the Shanghai Gold Exchange's own vaults or authorized vaults uh, into public hands. It is quite simple. That is what the Shanghai Gold Exchange defines as uh, gold delivered. Um, and uh, the, so there's no two ways about it. Yeah, I mean, right now we're seeing a lot of volatility in the market right now. And just, I think it was yesterday, Switzerland said they're going to be looking into gold manipulation at, I think, seven different banks. Um, do you think there is a huge uh, manipulation of gold right now? Yes. I mean, there are two levels of manipulation. There's state manipulation, which has been with us um, really ever since, um, I suppose, the Bank of England fixed the rate of gold you know, to, to pound sterling. I mean, that is manipulation, let's face it. 
Um, uh, so, you know, right through the $35, right through um, uh, the sort of free trading when um, the price of gold suddenly moved away from the $35 level and was completely beyond control. And the Nixon shock came, came about where America said, well, you know, who cares about gold anyway? It's no longer money. Uh, we deny it. We deny it has any monetary role whatsoever, sort of thing. Um, but the government still manipulates it because the government does understand, and we've seen this from, um, you know, sort of uh, testimony from people like Alan Greenspan well after the Nixon shock, that, um, you know, the, the, um, the, the best indicator as to whether the dollar is down or up is gold. You know, if people lose faith in the dollar, then it's reflected in the higher gold price. Um, so it is manipulated. And of course, what you're referring to is uh, bank manipulation. Um, and here again, um, it's exactly the same as the manipulation we've seen in other markets, LIBOR, foreign exchanges and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Um, central banks are in there in all those markets all the time manipulating them. I mean, after all, what else is uh, central bank dictates that the rate of interest is X? That is manipulation. It's not allowing the market to set the rate. The central bank can manipulate the rates, but banks are not allowed to do it. So they get a huge rate fines as they do it. I mean, I think it's sort of pots and kettles <laughs> calling <laughs> each other black to a large extent. Um, but uh, so in a sense, um, I mean, yes, it doesn't surprise me at all that banks have been doing this. Um, and what the, There's an interesting history in this because... Um, uh, Deutsche Bank uh, was forced to turn over all its records of uh, precious metals dealings uh, to Baffin, which is the German um, uh, banking regulator, uh, and uh, it's all gone rather quiet. But Deutsche Bank uh, decided to withdraw from the silver fixing and um, it put its um, gold fixing seat up for sale and then just withdrew because there were no buyers for it, which again is interesting because that tells me that compliance officers in the big banks are saying, um, or they were saying at the time, uh, that, uh, well, you know, to be part of the, um, the gold fix, oh dear, oh dear, we've got issues with this, <laughs> you know, pass. <laughs> So if you've got senior compliance lawyers in uh, the bullion banks uh, deciding to back off the fixing process, then that does indicate that there's something really rather wrong with the whole, the whole situation. So to me, um, uh, the uh, Swiss regulators uh, looking at uh, uh, banking, you know, banks manipulating the oil price is no surprise whatsoever. I mean, do you think anything will come out of this? Just like LIBOR, do you think they're going to come up, maybe, maybe fine a couple banks? That's about it. Well, excuse me for being overtly cynical, but regulators seem to live off fines. So you know, I think that answers the question. <laughs> so let me switch to what's been happening um, around the world. I mean, we're seeing the stock market. I mean, it's one day it's up, the next day it's way down. And we're seeing this since August. I mean, and then we hear, you know, corporations laying off Deutsche Bank, Unicredit, Kraft Heinz, Lenovo. I mean, thousands of people, they're just laying off people. I mean, what is your take on what's going on in the world right now? Well, there's sort of two sides of the problem. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, the, what I call the welfare states, in other words, the advanced economies who, um, uh, if you like, pay for us all from cradle to grave <laughs> <laughs> um, out of our own savings. Uh, sorry, that was a touch cynical maybe, but I don't think overtly. Um, they uh, do have a problem because uh, what they have done is they've taken their statistics and they have made them... Um, what they want them to be. So things like unemployment statistics, um, inflation statistics have become totally meaningless. Uh, they are creatures of the state. Um, the, the area which, of course, uh, the welfare states cannot control are the emerging markets. And uh, in this case, you've got China, which is about half the total emerging markets in terms of uh, GDP, um, had a credit uh, boom uh, generated by the state. And now that credit boom is um, contracting rather rapidly. And the symptoms of this, if you like, um, are uh, a collapsing stock market. Um, companies uh, laying off people, and so on and so forth. Now, the problem we have nowadays is that the emerging markets actually represent more than half total uh, world trade. Uh, and uh, so it's no longer a situation where, uh, you know, the sort of, if you like, Europe and uh, America and Japan between them really sort of controlled all world trade. No, that's absolutely changed. So we're now in a situation where there is contagion, if you like, from the problems in 
uh, the emerging economies. Um, and that, if you like, is giving us all a very nasty dose of flu. Uh, and and uh, I think I, I think it's a very important point to realize that just how this has switched round. And so the idea um, that we've had in the past that the Fed can actually ignore what's going on in the world because, uh, you know, she's a huge internal economy and only 20 percent of her uh, GDP is cross-border trade. I mean, that's all changed, actually. Uh, and the result is that um, we face uh, global events which are completely beyond the Fed's control, and that is why the Fed had to change uh, the very carefully laid out uh, interest rate policy of they were going to raise interest rates in September or thereabouts. That has now been blown out of the window by the emerging economies. Uh, and, and I think that um, there's a big lesson in it because not only um, has the interest rate story been blown out of the window, uh, I think that the effect of these emerging market economies with the collapse in commodity prices at the center of it all um, it means that we've got further turbulence, if I can put it that way, in, in uh, markets in the, welfare, in, in, the, in the welfare states. So you wrote an article um, from ZERP to NERP, and you just mentioned uh, the Fed with their interest rates. And we see right now they're holding off. I mean, they're still saying they're going to do it. I mean, and then they mention negative interest rates. Can they actually raise interest rates? Is it possible or are they just out there just talking? I think they wish they could raise interest rates because with interest rates at zero, they don't have an interest rate tool. And I think that um, anyone with any common sense, and I think there is a little bit of common sense if you really dig deep into the minds of a central banker, there is some common sense there. You know, they sort of feel there's something wrong with the world of zero interest rates. And, um, you know, we can't be there forever and we have to move away from it. <laughs> but the answer to your question, Dave, is no, I can't see how they can uh, raise interest rates because think what it is. What we're talking about is raising the Fed funds rate. The Fed funds rate is what the Fed pays banks to leave money on deposit at the Fed, the bulk of which today is excess reserves. They have something like $2.6 trillion on deposit at the Fed. If you raise interest rates, all that happens is that the banks will be encouraged to increase their deposits at the Fed. And if they increase their deposits at the Fed, it means they reduce the, um, the creation of bank credit. So, you, you, you know, they're sort of forced into a situation where if they raise rates, they're going to contract the economy. Um, and if they don't raise the raise rates, they're sort of stuck on a zero bound, which is actually achieving completely zero. So <laughs> it's it really is a huge, great problem. So with this negative interest rate, part of your article is saying that they're trying to stimulate price inflation and they're trying to, you know, they're saying this is going to be a benefit to the people. I mean, really, negative interest rate, does this really benefit the people in any way? It doesn't be benefit the people, no. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that um, moving away from letting people set their own interest rates is not for the benefit of people. It really is not. Um, I mean, think of all the savers who mm. are... Um, robbed, if you like, of a rightful level of interest. Um, and we're all savers, unless we're really so impecunious that we've got no savings whatsoever. But that's a very small minority. I mean, th th this is a complete nonsense, this macroeconomic approach that they have got to manage the interest rates for the benefit of the all. I mean, all they're doing, actually, is they are managing interest rates to the disadvantage of everybody because money is, in effect, stored labor. The reason that we use money is we turn what we produce, whether it's a service we provide someone or we make something to sell, um, we turn that into money before we spend it. And when we spend it, we either spend it immediately in the form of consumer goods or we spend it on a delayed basis. In other words, we put it into savings. And, um, you know, really all this monkeying around with um, ZERP and NERP and all the rest of it um, is, is, is interfering with that very, very important process. It's not for our benefit at all. I mean, the Fed, I mean, what is it, like 55 times now they told us that they're going to be you know, doing something with the interest rates. Aren't they losing credibility at this point? People looking at them saying, okay, they're not really doing anything. And, you know, they're never going to do anything. So what is their credibility at this point? 
Um, it's a very good question. I think that I think they've lost credibility on two fronts. Um, the one is the way in which our conversation is going. I think that we've got an increasing band of people who are beginning to realize that the function of a, of a central bank is, is, is a complete confidence trick. It's, it's unnecessary. You don't really need a central bank, if you like, to set interest rates. But then there is the other level, which is the immediate market level. The, the market um, has become very dependent on reading what the, in, what, what the Fed says, um, being confident that the Fed has control over the situation. And the moment the market begins to feel that the Fed hasn't got control over the situation, uh, suddenly the situation gets quite a lot more dangerous uh, because markets could re re-establish proper prices. Um, so I would say that this loss of confidence is really on two levels. Um, they can get the market confidence back, I think, um, but they would have to think very, very carefully how they do it. Um, I've got some ideas as to how they might proceed on that, but I have to say that it would be at the continuing loss of confidence amongst the wider public. You know, in other words, uh, I think that they could probably, um, you know, rescue the the loss of credibility they've got in the markets on a short term basis, but long term, I think they're just they're continuing to lose credibility. Yeah, I mean, uh, at this point in time, I mean, the. The stock market, where which everyone looks at, uh, you know, this is their gauge of how the economies are doing for a lot of people, and they're continually seeing the market go down. Um, sometimes it moves up a little bit, but since August, it's really been bad. Um, not just here in the U.S., out in Asia, Europe, and finally here in the U.S. And right now, since they're not doing anything with interest rates, everything is just set. To where it is, they're not really doing anything. I mean, where do we go from here? What's what do you think is going to happen? Well, I, I think um, let's not mince words. Uh, we have a bear market. I think it's actually as mm. simple as that. Um, your point about uh, equity markets is 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 right. Um, it's if you like, it, it's the the most visible form of um, uh, working out what an asset is worth. If the stock market is going down, then you can be fairly sure that other assets are also, if they're not actually falling in value, they are likely to fall in value at some stage in the future. So um, a collapsing stock market is going to hit property prices at some stage. Uh, for example, it may well already be. I mean, but the problem with property is that um, you can't really measure it all that that well because there is no such thing as a standard value. Um, but I have no doubt that we are now in a bear market uh, for equities. Um, and when you're in a bear market, suddenly, going back to your point about uh, confidence in the central banks, everything the central bank does somehow either doesn't work or it makes it worse. And I think that that is the sort of problem that we're likely to um, to find in the future. Uh, you know, sort of have investments and hoping that these investments are going to recover, um, I'm afraid, are going to find that um, it ain't going to happen. I mean, uh, well, I mean, not, not every investment, of course, goes down, but uh, the vast majority of investments, I think, in stocks um, are going to be worth somewhat less this time next year. We hear a lot of talk about QE4, um, the Fed might, you know, start creating a lot more currency, and they're going to try to prop up the system. Do you, do you see that occurring again? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I don't think. I mean, I don't think it cures anything. I mean, after all, uh, it, we are where we are, as it were, um, after QEs one, two, and three. And has it done anything? Are we any better off? No, I can't see that. All QE four will do, I think is it will prop up the system because the system itself, particularly if you get falling asset prices, uh, is getting more and more shaky by the day. So on that basis, I think QE4 will be aimed at continuing to prop up the financial system, which after all is what uh, the other quantitative easing uh, has been all about. It's all gone at the banks to help their balance sheets. And, uh, you know, I mean, the stated objective is to stimulate the economy. But if you want to stimulate the economy, you don't necessarily give the money to the banks because the banks aren't necessarily going to lend. And we've found out that, that the hard way. 
So and indeed, why why should they? I mean, they you know if they uh, you know the decision a bank makes to lend is between it and a potential borrower. It's got actually nothing to do with the central bank at all. And what's confused, Alistair? What's confusing to a lot of people? Uh, and I think if they went ahead and said, okay, we're gonna you know start uh, implementing QE four. All this time, they've been telling us that the economy is recovering, it's doing better, and this is why we're going to raise interest rates. And now they're going to come out with QE4. How do they explain this? Well, <laughs> I, they, in a sense, they don't have to, because the great thing, I mean, I'm looking at it from the point of view of a, of, of a central bank issuing currency. The great thing about monetary inflation is that nobody actually understands what's going on. And that gives you cover to do what you want. And so what you do is you print money and you call it something fancy like quantitative easing. And uh, everybody thinks, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what that means. Now, come on. It just means they're printing money. <laughs> you know, it's actually as simple as that. But because you call it quantitative easing, you know, suddenly it's got a mystique and it becomes a solution or a potential solution to uh, a problem real or imagined. I and mean, that's what it's all about, really. So um, it, it is simply that. I mean, we've got a problem. Uh, how are we going to uh, resolve this? We can't increase taxes because otherwise there'd be riots on the streets. So we'll print some money and nobody will notice. And that's actually it in a nutshell. Do you still see the economies um, falling, melting down, falling apart at this point? Um, I see... I see a lot of problems that have been created by the state's interference with the basic um, function of uh, you and me buying and selling things um, on the basis that what we buy and sell um, are actually wanted and economically useful. The, 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 the state has interfered with that so much that... Um, there is a huge element of the economy that needs to be washed out. Malinvestments, if you like, um, is, is the term certainly that the Austrian economists use mm. for um, uh, capital that has not been reallocated into something productive. It has been encouraged to stay in unproductive um, uh, um, parts of the economy or parts of the economy that produce things that nobody actually wants. Um, so in that sense, it is unproductive. And I think that... Um, Therefore, I mean, the only way in which this can really uh, be resolved is for that process of stopping um, the evolution of capital from unproductive um, uh, use to, towards productive use. I mean, you know, you've got to allow that to happen. And if you don't allow it to happen, eventually the market will force it upon you. And that's that really is, I think, the process was to where we are. And this is why the, you know, the economy is not really going anywhere, because the whole process by which the economy works has been interfered with by government. So, um, but we, I must say something else. And this, mm -hmm. is, this, this, this is something that um, really does confuse the macroeconomists. Um, we all have to get on with life. Um, and so even though um, the state messes up things, uh, you know, we still need to um, go and make things. We still need to buy things. We still operate on an economic basis as individuals. So the technology that has evolved uh, with things like um, just, you know, home entertainment, flat, you know, flat screen TVs and all the rest of it, that process of evolution continues. The evolution of um, internet and software and, um, you know, the things that can be done now, uh, that continues apace. But this is something that is not controlled by government. If it was controlled by government, it wouldn't happen. It's as simple as that. So at one level, uh, things get better and better and better for us. But at another level, it's rather like, um, you know, sort of driving a car with a foot on the brake the whole time, wondering why suddenly there's a sort of smell of burning rubber and burning this and all coming out of the economy. And that's roughly where we are, I'm afraid. Do you think that something might set off the economy? I mean, back in 2008, we had the uh, subprime and kind of everything just blew up. We saw Bear Stearns, Lehman. I mean, now they're talking about Deutsche Bank, Glencore. I mean, do you see like a black swan occurring? Well, <laughs> black swans are not meant to happen <laughs> or not meant to exist. Um, 
But, uh, I mean, you know, the stories about Deutsche Bank have been around for some time. Uh, Glencore is a natural consequence of collapsing commodity prices. Um, and it's not just Glencore. I mean, other, you know, other, other companies, if you like, that do the same sort of thing, um, have the same difficulties. I mean, I'm, I'm led to believe there's something like um, six or seven trillion of debt which is commodity related. And we include energy in this, by the way. So this is also includes shale, um, shale oil. Um, but of that six or seven trillion, probably around about two to three trillion, two to two and a half trillion maybe, is impaired. Um, uh, this is a huge, huge, great problem. And I think this is why uh, the share price of, of, of a company like Glen, Glencore is, has come under such pressure because people are beginning to realize there is a financial effect of falling commodity prices. Um, it's so far that the shale industry seems to have not caught the headlines. But that, again, I think, uh, you know, the, the, there are going to be huge losses there. And it will impact on banks. Um, and I th quite a lot of banks. America has actually been, I think, a lot more sensible than most jurisdictions when it comes to getting their banks to bolster their balance sheets. We haven't seen the same sense in Europe. I mean, in Europe, basically what they've done is they've thrown high quality debt at the banks. So they've tried to improve, if you like, the, the quality of lending rather than the capital ratios of the banks. But the quality of lending, of course, basically means you buy sovereign debt, you know, which, oh dear, Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and, and mm. so on and so forth. So, you know, that gives you another problem. Uh, and this is why, you know, we come back to some of the major banks in, um, in, in the Eurozone, um, of which Deutsche Bank is one, there are others. Uh, and it's, it's hardly surprising that the spotlight has, you know, and there's a degree, degree of speculation has centered upon them. So at this point, I mean, we see, I mean, last time we spoke, we talked about how much debt there is in the world and they're not raising the interest rates. So they're keeping all the payments for the debt very, very low. How long do you think this can continue on until the whole thing just falls apart? Well, um, that's that's a very good question. I mean, eventually it will fall apart. Of that, I have no doubt. The timing, of course, is the issue, and that's basically the question you're asking. I think um, it, it depends on interest rate policy from here. If uh, the problems in the emerging uh, economies uh, basically start hitting, uh, particularly uh, the United States, in the sense that uh, there's a growing feeling in the, in, in the Fed that the economy is beginning to tank as opposed to just sort of bubble along, as it were, which is, you know, roughly what I've sort of tried to describe. You know, we get on with life, mm -hmm. you know, despite the Fed. Um, but if they feel that things are going to tank, then I think there is little doubt they will start seriously discussing um, the introduction of negative interest rates. Um, I mean, we're not there yet. But we could well be there uh, because um, with, you know, we're at zero. Zero hasn't worked. Central banker basically thinks, well, if zero doesn't work, perhaps we ought to go negative. I mean, he's got no evidence that, that I mean, he knows that. <laughs> I mean, he, he seems to not understand that mucking around with interest rates just basically doesn't work. So but so given that he still doesn't understand it, he's likely to talk about uh, um, uh, negative interest rates. Now, negative interest rates, I think, uh, is, will be full of um, unforeseen problems. One I see is that uh, it will put um, commodities into a natural state of backwardation in the market. What I mean by that is that um, commodities uh, for delivery today are going to be more expensive than commodities for delivery tomorrow. Now, this is an important point. It's not the commodities themselves that have put this, that, that, that with negative interest rates would put them into this position, but it's the fact that money, cash, is worth less than credit, which is so bizarre, it is beyond reason, but that is actually what we're talking about. Now, um, that could have an effect in the commodity markets because a lot of the banks uh, run trading books where they're naturally short of commodities. I mean, after all, they've profited hugely from the fall in oil in the oil price and copper price and gold and silver. So you can see that, um, you know, the whole of the futures market um, suddenly is going to have to deal and accommodate with a situation where everything 
naturally goes into backwardation. Now, I don't know how this is going to work out, but what I do know is the area which I really do cover, which is gold and silver, is that this actually could be very, very serious. Um, and I think that if you have a situation which, we, as, as we have at the moment, where there is very little uh, physical gold in the West to deliver, um, if deliver, delivery should be called upon, um, if on top of that, uh, we have actually backwardations at the moment in a, a lot of markets when it comes to, to the gold price, uh, if we add to that negative interest rates, the backwardation is going to become so acute that it will be impossible for any bank, any dealer, any bullion bank to actually run negative, uh, if you like, short positions in gold. Hmm. So um, that, I think, could force a stampede of banks trying to close out those positions because with time they lose money on those positions. Now that obviously is not something that a bank wants to see. So I can see that as being actually very disruptive of anything that the Fed wants to achieve. If suddenly the banks turn uh, buyers, and I'm talking about the commercial banks, the bullion banks, if they turn buyers of physical gold because owning physical gold is cheaper than <laughs> than owning money, as it were, because of negative interest rates, then, my goodness, we're going to have a real problem because where is the gold going to come from? So the liability, the, you know, the liabilities in the market in terms of short positions is considerably greater than any availability of gold. And the same is true of silver, by the way. So do you see gold going up at that point? Well, on negative interest rates, I think one of the unintended consequences could be that the price of gold will accelerate and almost accelerate out of control. So, um, <laughs> you know, we're a long way from this, I hasten to add. Um, but what is going to be interesting is to see how the market reacts to any sort of feeling that um, the United States, the dollar is moving towards negative interest rates. Because I think that uh, as people actually think this one through, um, it could have a, a huge effect on the gold price, which is something which... I think that the Fed would not intend. And here, of course, we now see the an interesting question being uh, answered. Does the Fed really care about the gold price or not? <laughs> it's going to be an interesting one. Alistair, thank you for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. I really appreciate